All right, I'm going to be preaching from the 27th chapter of the book of Acts. That is, the book of Acts are the actions of the apostles. And the book of Acts was written by one of the companions of Paul, a convert of Paul, He's known to us as Luke, the physician. He is also, he's given us the gospel of Luke. He was not an apostle, but he was a companion to the apostle. With Luke and Acts, two lengthy writings from Luke that actually make up a quarter of our New Testament. So Luke provides us with a lot of information. Now, the 27th chapter deals with a time of Paul in a storm. Now, in 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us, in reminiscing the fights and the trials that he went through, Paul was someone who suffered a lot and had a lot of uh, negative experience of being a Christian. And in that he lists, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, and a night and a day I spent in the deep. So he, in the list of his trials and troubles, he includes and tells us that three times he was in a shipwreck. Well, Luke provides us one of those times. Luke captures in the book of Acts uh, the story of one of those shipwrecks. I found a dramatization of this chapter, and so you'll actually see the little verses displayed as it goes through. So, Acts, the 27th chapter. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius. Yeah and we put out to sea. The next day, we landed at Sidon. From there, we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete, opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens, near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast. So Paul warned them. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. 
So, keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless those men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach, where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the runners. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get their own planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land in safety. May the Lord add blessing to the hearing of his word. How to survive a sinking ship. This is Luke telling the story as Luke was with him in this particular storm. Just like to highlight uh, a couple of verses from this chapter. This storm was not something that took place in one night. It wasn't just a bad night. It tells us when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. So this was not just a bad night. This went on for some time. He continues it. It says, on the 14th night, this storm went on for a couple of weeks. They were here, battling the storm, still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. And when it was about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching the land. Now, the storm that took a couple of weeks, we know that God made a supernatural deliverance. For Paul. It goes on and says, Last night an angel of God, of the God whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with me. So it makes it very clear that God promised Paul that he would save him, that he would not die in this storm, that not only would he not die and that God would deliver him, but that God would deliver all those that are with him. It concludes, it says, when he, the centurion, ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached the land safely. A storm is when an unpleasantry comes into your life. Storm is an unpleasant experience. A storm is when things go wrong in your life. 
A storm is when you've had a job for 15, 20 years and you're called into the office and they say, we're sorry, we have to let you go. A storm is when you've been married for 15, 25 years and your spouse comes and says, I want a divorce, I want out. These are storms. A storm is when, despite you feel healthy, the doctor says, we need to do some more tests because we don't like what we found. A storm is when, after doing all your best to raise children, to live godly lives and you see them go astray. These are storms and storms aren't unique to believers. The Bible says, He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You don't go through a storm because you're a believer. Now there are certain storms that you will find yourself in just because you are a believer. But being born again doesn't make you in and of itself a candidate for a storm. Being an unbeliever doesn't make you a candidate for a storm. Anybody can go through a storm. And everybody does go through storms. If you lived long enough, you have been through storms. And you can be sure if God spares you long enough, you will go through more storms. So what difference does it make, the Christian, if I still have to go through storms? if I'm not promised exemption from a storm. Whether you're a Christian or not, you go through storms, but the significant difference is that if you are a Christian, Jesus will go with you through every storm. The Bible actually tells several stories about storms. They were common occurrences and they were common to the people of the Bible. There's quite a few stories about storms. One popular story, probably the most famous storm story in the New Testament, we find in Matthew 14, a scripture that we preached from several times. It says, but the boat was already a long distance from the land. And keep in mind that, by the way. I'm going to come back to that. The boat was a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Here, the disciples are in a boat, and Jesus is not with them. And they found themselves in a storm. And in the fourth watch, of the night, he, Jesus, came to them walking on the sea. Story goes on, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, notice it doesn't say they were just full of joy and faith, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear because in a storm, it's hard to recognize Jesus Christ. It's not always easy to sense the presence of God when you're in a storm. I feel me getting happy already. <laughs> Immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. So we have a story of a storm and we see 
a tremendous, amazing miracle. Jesus comes and walks on the water to meet them and save them from their danger. The miracles go on in this instance. It says, Then Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you to, on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Now we talked about this before because you've often heard the story say that Peter was able to walk on the water as long as he had his eyes on Jesus. The moment he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the waves and the sea and focused on the storm, he began to sink. But as we mentioned before, Peter doubted way before he got out on the water. He doubted back in the boat when he says, Lord, if it is you. Because Jesus had just told him, it is I. So Peter doubted before he got out. The fact that he looked at the storm and focused on the storm was a symptom of his lack of faith. You see, if you're not walking in faith, you are apt to take your eyes off Jesus. If you're not walking in faith, when the storms come, you'll start focusing on your circumstances. The miracle actually doesn't stop there. Although we have amazing miracles. We have Jesus walking on the water. We have Peter walking on the water. When he began to sink, the Lord saved them. There's another miracle that occurred here. I don't know if you've ever noticed it before. But in John's account of the same story, he tells a different angle. It says, The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then when they rowed about three or four miles, remember I said they were a great distance off, three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. Same story. And drawing near to the boat, they were frightened. Then notice what happens. He said, it is I. They were willing to receive them into the land, and immediately the boat was in the land to which they were going. Now, I don't know how many people caught that, but they were miles off of sea and in the storm, and instantly the entire boat was translated, raptured, if you will, and brought to the dry land, to the land that they were going. This is God at work in a storm. There is another story. This time, Jesus is in the boat with them. And he's sleeping. And a storm comes upon them. Jesus, they woke him up. And then he arose, Jesus arose, and rebuked the wind and the sea, and said, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. God at work in stones. When you look at these couple of stories of God delivering people out of the stones, it's spectacular. It's amazing. And we look at that and we say, what a mighty God we serve that he's able to do these miraculous things to bring his people out of storms. But he delivered them in this storm as well. But this is what it looked like. It says that they made it to the shore on planks or on other pieces of the ship. People there made their rescue, received their rescue from God on broken pieces of the ship. The Bible says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word 
of their testimony. Now, in many churches, and we talked about different churches, and I've been in several churches, we used to actually have what we call testimony services. We've done them at Grace Gospel, we even did a couple here. And a testimony service is when we would call people up to the mic for you to share with us something that God has done in your life. And folks would come up and they would talk about how God worked something out on their job or provided them with the healing. They're basically success stories. And we like hearing success stories. We like hearing miracles that are occurring in other people's lives. They encourage us. They inspire us. But what would the testimony service have looked like from these people? In the early church, you know the apostles recounted these storm stories that they've had. They may have told them hundreds of times to the churches. And you can just hear the church listening to Peter standing up and saying, yes, we were on a storm. And our Lord and Savior walked on the water and brought us to safety. The electricity in the church that morning as Peter recounts this miracle at sea. James and John getting up before the church and saying, yeah, we were on a song and we thought we, it was all over. And the master stood up and just rebuked the wind and the sea and just stopped the storm in our lives. And what the service must have looked like when Paul or Luke recounted this story. And as they come up to the mic and say, we were in the storm once, it lasted for days. And you can see the people sitting up in their seat, wondering, what did God do in your storm? And then he says, well, after many days, the ship finally crashed. What are you talking about, Paul? Didn't Jesus walk on the water and meet you? No. That didn't happen. Did God just stop the storm and bring you safely? No. That didn't happen either. My ship sank. But how did you get saved? Well, we came swimming up to the shore. Some of us were hanging on to broken pieces of the ship. That's how we got our deliverance. It doesn't sound like an exciting testimony. It doesn't sound very miraculous. And yet this is the protocol, the standard of so many of the people of God. You see, when you find yourself in storms, Jesus doesn't always come walking on the water. He doesn't always come rebuking the storm out of your life. Sometimes your ship crashes. Sometimes your ship breaks apart. Yet you can know that through it all, God brought me out. Some of us are going to come up and we're not going to be able to have testimonies that I got my healing when I prayed for it. We're not going to be able to say that God saved my marriage. There's going to be so many folks are saying that, well, I, I was sick and I prayed and I never got the healing. I prayed for my loved one, but they died anyway. 
There are those who are going to say that I've tried to hold on to my marriage, but it still fell apart. In other words, the ship has sunk. My ship broke apart, and yet through it all, I know that God never left me. Know that He was still always there. There are some of us, when we look back, we have to say we didn't get every victory that we thought we were going to get. We didn't always overcome every temptation that came our way. We were not able to overcome every struggle that came our way. There were times when we failed. There were times when we messed up. There were times when we thought we would get over something and only end up falling. But just because you fall, it doesn't mean that God is not delivering you. Sometimes your ship breaks up. Sometimes your ship will go down in the river. But through it all, you can know that he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll be with you always, even through the darkest storm. Even though you don't get your miracle, you may not get the blessing that you were hoping for, but you can know I'm still here, hanging on to a broken ship. I'm still here. I may be coming up against the shore. I may be called cut up. I may be bruised, but you know he's going to bring me to the other side. I may come up spitting up water. I may come up bleeding out of my body. But to know that I'm still here and when you get over to the other side, you'll be able to look back and say how I got over. My soul looks back and wonder how I got over. I didn't get every victory. Every prayer wasn't answered, but I survived the sinking ship. If you love the Lord, give him a praise. Hallelujah.